Hello, welcome to The Query. This is Zan Khan. Today our guest is an American author and occultist. A member of the OTO since 1976, the secret fraternal organization that practices occult and especially the teachings of Alistair Crowley. He soon founded one of its oldest lodges, the Tehuti Lodge, in New York City in 1979. He is described by Dan Bernstein as the founder of the modern OTO in his guide to Dan Brown's novel Angels and Demons. He will be on our show decoding the OTO and asking the most deepest questions related to the secret society. Today our guest is none other than James Weserman. Welcome to our show James Weserman. This is Zan Khan. Welcome to The Query. I'm delighted to be here, Zane, and I hope this is not the last time. Thank you. Mr. James Weserman, let's start off by asking, what is the OTO? Well, the OTO is a uh, modern post-Masonic organization that is devoted to the Book of the Law, the teachings of the Book of the Law. When I say post-Masonic, I mean that we are, we are not Masons, uh, but our roots are deeply in Masonry. The Book of the Law was dictated to Aleister Crowley in 1904, and it proclaims a new law for mankind, a law of ultimate freedom and responsibility, a law that states that each individual has a purpose on earth, what we call the true will, like the course of a star as it revolves in the heavens. It's, it's an open link with the divine, and our law is a law of freedom. And uh, the purpose of the OTO is to instruct in the law of freedom, to encourage through art, writing, um, broadcast through our personal behavior in any way that we can to open up mankind to the nature of freedom. A lot of uh, people are, are very afraid of freedom. Freedom is a daunting concept because it involves a tremendous amount of responsibility. And in order to, uh, to be a free person, you, you really must be a self-disciplined person. What the OTO is essentially trying to do is, is teach the law of freedom to people, to teach them that um, freedom involves responsibility, but that it is such a glorious thing, very similar to uh, some of the concepts of ancient Egypt, where after enduring the trials and tests of initiation, the, the person was free to feast and dine with the gods, to, to be at one with them, and to be accepted and invited into their company. Well, if, if you're going to be doing that, you know, you can't be some uh, uh, sloppy uh, individual who is not prepared to accept, you know, the, the kind of self-discipline that a divine being would would necessarily uh you know demand of him or herself so the oto's task is a difficult one uh we have um we do rituals uh we do a lot of publication work um more and more we're doing audio and video uh to try to communicate to a wider audience the nature of what we call the law of Thelema, the law of do what thou wilt. Um, you know, this is something that has been misinterpreted for so long as, as people saying, oh, well, if I can do what I wilt. That means I can do anything I want. I can steal, murder, rape, rob. On the contrary, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law was called by Crowley, you know, the most austere ethical precept ever uttered. Uh, in, in human history because it demands of each one of us that we become the most responsible person. Thou hast no right but to do thy will. No other behavior is acceptable other than following the truth of our being. 
And, and this is a very profound and intense kind of obligation. And the purpose of the OTO is, is to teach that, to suggest that people like myself presumably are living that way. And our example is hopefully one that will um, inspire others to take up the challenge of, of doing their own true wills. A lot of people are of the opinion that Aleister Crowley was some sort of a Satanist, also labeled as the wickedest man on earth by some newspapers. What is your uh, opinion on that? Uh, Zane, in my opinion, it's a total misconception. Aleister Crowley had a, had a gigantic sense of humor and, and he was a trickster and a prankster. So he loved to shock people and, and it gave him a great deal of pleasure to do so. But to be a, a Satanist, one, one must be a Christian of sorts. In other one, words, one must look at the dichotomy as if God were not all powerful. Now, if God is all powerful, obviously that being cannot have a, a counterpoint of, of, of an adversary, a Satan. It simply doesn't work. Uh, one who accepts the, uh, the reality of, of God accepts everything and Crowley did accept everything and and you know there's sorrow and there's joy there's good and there's evil um there's happiness and 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 enthusiasm and then there's pain and despair this is a very wide world and Crowley accepted all of it and and the true religious person will accept all of it. On the other hand, his sense of humor uh, caused him to try to shock people. And, and he did that very well. And he was considered the wickedest man uh, in the world by several scandalous uh, newspapers, very much like some of the newspapers of today. It, it was his joke. And, and not something I take very seriously. There was also this incident where Crowley's student drank cat blood while performing a ritual under Crowley's supervision and he died. How do you explain this incident? Well, it's not real. My, um, my understanding of that is not really an interpretation. What, what I understand the facts of that situation to be are that there was some kind of dysentery or, or something in the water uh, where Crowley was living in uh, Cefalu in, in Italy and uh, in Sicily. And that Raul Loveday, uh, the disciple, uh, drank some of the water and became sickened by it. Now, his death was a tragedy. His wife uh, hated Crowley. She was very jealous of his influence on Raul. And when she went back to England, she started the story that Love Day was drinking cat's blood. I frankly don't believe that story. And um, I think he died of natural causes. I know that his death was a source of great sorrow for Crowley because Love Day was a very promising student and was part of this Abbe of Thelema uh, experiment that Crowley pursued for several years in Sapulu, and, and I think Loveday's death was probably the most tragic event of the entire uh, experiment. I think it troubled him deeply. You're a practitioner of OTO's rituals. Are you trying to say that there is no blood drinking involved? I, I have never drank blood at an OTO ritual. I've been involved in the OTO since 1976. Um, it's just not something that we do. It's something we're accused of doing. I personally don't even drink alcohol. Um, there's, there's call for alcohol in some of the OTO rituals in, in minimum quantity, but I don't even participate in that any longer. So, um, very definitely we do not drink blood, sir. Uh, we do not do that. Mr. Weserman, you mentioned that the OTO was a Freemasonic organization. Uh, does it have anything to do with Freemasonry at the moment? The uh, original founders of the OTO were all high degree Freemasons. Um, originally, well, masonry is only open to men. Traditional masonry is only open to men. 
these Freemasons who started the OTO invited women in so that they were automatically not quite Freemasons, or at least the OTO was not a Freemasonic organization. But for the males, they had to be Freemasons when, when they joined. It was only open to Freemasons. We no longer have that stipulation. You can join if you're not a Freemason. On the other hand, we also no longer claim to be a Freemasonic organization. We did back in Crowley's day. Uh, we said that we were Freemasons. Today, our leadership believes that is an impolite statement because since the Masons don't accept us as Freemasons, why should we claim to be something that they don't recognize? And since women are involved, um, we're not Freemasons. Uh, there are, as I understand it, in, in some Masons except women as members of female Masonry, but men and women are never in temple together as part of a Freemasonic ritual. In the OTO, we are. Uh, however, in OTO, we carry through, because of the Freemasonic uh, background that we had, um, our, our rituals have a, a, a component of Freemasonic symbolism in them. So they have been compared to uh, uh, certain of, of the rituals of Freemasonry. So there's quite a bit of overlap. And I might also add that a number of our members are Freemasons and a number of Freemasons uh, have joined OTO because they're looking for a deeper uh, inspiration. Freemasonry tends to uh, reject the occult. Uh, they, they tend to look at the esoteric aspect of Freemasonry almost with a certain amount of embarrassment, if, if, if you understand what I'm saying. They, they don't look at the inspiration of mythology as the most important thing. I, I think a, a great many Freemasons are involved in uh, good works, in charity, in, in, in education, and in, um, you know, uh, political um, uh, freedom as, as, a, as a goal for um, Masonic teaching. Uh, Freemasons, in, in many cases, could have been said to have started the United States. Most of the generals who served with uh, President Washington, General Washington, were Freemasons. Many of our presidents have been Freemasons. But uh, they were not working occultists in, in the sense that someone like, like I would be, or, or many of our members, someone like Crowley, we are really working with an esoteric and an occult current, and and that's the main focus of the OTO. So the differences between OTO and Freemasonry are, are rather great, but on the other hand, uh, OTO shares in the background of, of Freemasonry. Um, we have secret words, we have secret gestures, we have handshakes, we have um, ritual, um, you know, secrets that we convey to, to ourselves during our graded hierarchy of initiations, exactly the same that, uh, way that Freemasonry does. There's a tremendous amount of overlap. They're two different organizations. Uh, you just mentioned that your organization and Freemasonry has secret handshakes, symbolisms, and gestures. Uh, why the secrecy? Why not transparency for other people or outsiders? I think it's important to understand that a secret, a spiritual secret society is very much like a special interest group. If a person is interested in botany or zoology, they come together with other botanists or zoologists and pursue their common interest. And, and there's a difference between that and, say, real estate or uh, internet marketing. 
If I were a botanist and someone who was doing internet marketing stood up at my meeting and said, hey, I've got a great idea about how we can encourage internet marketing, I would feel that that person did not belong in the conversation. Not that there's anything wrong with internet marketing or, or real estate, but there are special interest groups in which those who are interested in those subjects meet and congregate with others of like mind. Our culture, particularly our modern culture, is filled with all kinds of distractions. And what we in spiritual secret societies do is to try to limit our distractions. So we have secret words and secret handshakes, and we only are interested in people who are interested in the same subjects that we are. That, that gives us a, a flexibility. It gives us a, a, a lack of distractions, which, as I say, in modern culture is the exception. Now, the words have meanings to us, and, and they're you know, filled with metaphysical concepts and blah, blah, blah. But the real idea is that if I give you a handshake or a sign or a password um, and you don't reveal it to anyone else, then I have a pretty good idea that I can trust you as a, as a, as a friend, as an intimate associate, someone that I can talk to about my own personal feelings, about metaphysical practices that may be controversial. And, and I can say, well, Okay, you know, uh, Zane didn't reveal the, the sign or the grip or the word. Uh, so maybe I can trust him with, you know, any number of other different things that apply to our specific task of, of investigating the spiritual mysteries that we, we have, uh, you know, looked, are looking into. OTO is looking into different mysteries than Freemasonry. Uh, and we're certainly all looking into different things than agriculture, horticulture, botany, zoology, real estate, or internet marketing. It, it really is a filter. We're trying to filter ourselves from distractions. And, and I think that's a, a good answer for you. By metaphysical practices, what are you trying to imply, Mr. Wesselman? Well, by metaphysical practices, what I mean is, you know, to begin with, sitting in meditation, sitting in a uh, still position that tries to limit any interference from the distractions provided by the body. Uh, when people try this, for example, they discover that all of a sudden they get itches in places that they never knew they had or they get little aches in places that they never experienced it before. The body is calling for attention. Your will and your mind is calling for the ability to free itself from the distraction of the body. Very much like we were talking about with, with why secret societies are limited to people who are in, in them. Uh, we try to focus the attention on the clarity of the mind, limiting the distractions of the body. The next thing that one does in meditation is to try to focus the mind. Now, all, thoughts will come, will spring out of all areas of the psyche, from thoughts about scheduling and responsibilities, to thoughts about family, to thoughts about childhood, uh, thoughts about any number of different uh, parts of the mind. Nonsense thoughts will associate, will begin to rise up. Anything to distract the mind from one pointed attention. Now, one of the techniques that people use is uh, called mantra yoga, uh, where we repeat a phrase over and over again and try to focus the attention on that phrase to the exclusion of all other distractions. Um, the same is true with the breath. We, when we are in the position that we have chosen to limit the physical distractions of posture, we work on 
rhythmical breathing so that the mind is also focused on a specific intent, the intent to breathe. And by counting and creating rhythmic breathing, it also stimulates the flow of energy within the body. That flow of energy tends to envelop the mind with a, with a very positive, mystical, vibratory life force. Then we further try to work on, on focusing the mind on very specific things. Uh, it could be a geometrical form and, and recording the, the number of times one is distracted from that central focus of your thought. It's, meditation is a complex, involved practice. It begins with the very simplest of all um, exercises and proceeds to more complicated uh, ones as you progress. And the ability to focus the mind is what we in uh, spiritual secret societies and mystical practices, and this applies to yogis as well as Western magicians. In fact, it applies to virtually anyone on the spiritual path. The ability to think thoughts of one's own choosing and, and uh, ex escape from distraction is probably the most important part of worldwide spiritual practices. Over time, these kinds of things are, are believed to help one in the transition through death. Um, and at the same time, what made Crowley so unique, one of the things that made him so unique, was his marriage of the spiritual practices of the East with the occult disciplines of the West. And Crowley's magicians are first and foremost working with concentrating the mind so that their magic is that much more powerful. He really accomplished a major step in the development of, of spiritual and religious uh, freedom by, by doing that, by mar marrying Western and Eastern technologies. Uh, you mentioned magic. Are you trying to say that some secret and spiritual societies like Freemasons and the OTO practice magic? Well, let me not speak about Freemasonry because I, I don't know. I do know that some Freemasons practice magic, but as a whole, I would say that Freemasonry is not um, interested in the individual practice of magic. Mr. Wesserman, you mentioned magic. Let let's explore that dimension. What is magic? Is there such thing as black magic, white magic? What is magic actually like? Is it like popping a rabbit out of a hat or, or does it have a bigger horizon? Aleister Crowley defined magic as the science and art of causing change to occur at will. That could be as simple as turning on a light switch. That's a willed action to change one's environment. We were talking about meditation at a certain point and intentional breathing. That could be considered an act of magic because you're actually changing consciousness by regulating your breath a certain way. Um, I'm a writer, as, as you know, so I will be trying to share an idea with with uh, a wider number of people. I may take a pen or a keyboard and, and type my thoughts into um, a manuscript designed to influence, inform, or um, otherwise cause other people to think. That's an act of magic. Spiritual magic uh, has different aspects to it. Some people uh, talk about black magic and white magic. It's a very common definition uh, uh, to have about around magic. Um, for example, they'll say that white magic is doing good and black magic is doing bad. 
And, you know, if you try to, let's say, kill someone with magic, uh, that would be considered black magic. And if you're trying to save someone's life or heal somebody, that would be considered white magic. What happens if the person you were trying to kill was a mass murderer or someone like Adolf Hitler? Would it be black magic to try and kill him? What if trying, what if someone trying to heal another person, you know, was somebody like Hugo Chavez? I mean, is that really a good thing to heal? So uh, is he a good candidate for preservation? Uh, these are questions that, that cause, I think your original uh, question was, is all magic simply magic? I would tend to accept that idea. That, that magic simply is the science and art of trying, you know, of causing change to occur at will. The most, personally to me, the most interesting magic is what I uh, put under the term of, of thaumaturgy, which is the magic of, of, of attempting to unite my consciousness with the divine through, um, through invocation and through invocation of a higher a higher spiritual level than my own. Um, we are constantly involved in that kind of learning experience in the OTO. Um, the Gnostic Mass, which we've mentioned, is a matter of trying to bring through the gods. I just did a, um, a ritual on television, actually, on the Discovery Channel called um, Secrets of Secret Society which I believe can be found on YouTube. And in, in that, uh, I was actually invoking the god of writing and communication named Tehuti. And I was trying to unite my consciousness with that archetype, with, with that being who has been understood in Tibetan culture and in Indian culture, in uh, Greek culture and Egyptian culture, uh, in Norse and Scan you know, Scandinavian culture, throughout the entire world, um, uh, Caribbean magic, they always have a teaching, talking, writing, or learning archetype, the, the god of the word. That's Tehuti, and, and I worked with him, and I tried to unite my consciousness with him. It was very profound experience. And that is certainly the kind of magic which I think is the most, um, the highest aspiration, the kind I enjoy the best. Uh, previously, you mentioned rituals. Are there any uh, rituals that include sex in the OTO? Sex magical rituals are essentially personal rituals in the OTO. Um, th there have been, there are, and I'm sure there will continue to be group rituals that involve sexual magic. Um, from an operative level, it, that can get very complicated. And I think um, there's a lot less of that perhaps going on than might appear to be from the reputation of OTO. I'm not saying it doesn't go on. I'm just saying that you don't join OTO to get involved in a uh, group sex magical ritual. If you do, I think you'll be pretty disappointed. Um, on the other hand, the, the Gnostic Mass is a symbolic ritual, which is a sexual magic ritual. And Aleister Crowley called the Gnostic Mass the central ritual, public and private, of the OTO. Now, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there is a, uh, a male and a female priest and priestess transforming the uh, bread and wine to the uh, body and blood of God. That is also a part of the, uh, an enormous part of the formula of sexual magic. Uh, sexual magic is something that uh, is taught in the OTO and I think practiced, I think it's probably more 
common to find couples practicing sexual magic with each other uh, than than uh, it is for uh, uh, public rituals of the, of that uh, not public I mean but group rituals. Um, it's a lot easier. Married couples are doing sexual magic, you know, literally all the time. Um, Crowley had a lot of talk and teaching on and writing on sexual magic and um, his form was personally, uh, let's say, different than my own. Um, I think everyone practices uh, sexual spirituality based on their own psyche and, and their own um, likes and dislikes, their own aesthetic code. Crowley made, made certain things clear that are universal to practitioners of sexual magic, um, namely that divine consciousness must be part of the ritual. It must be part of the, of the sex, if you will. Um, but I think he was differently motivated than I am personally, and uh, than a number of people I know who practice sexual magic are in their practice. And it's, um, it's very difficult to talk about because it is so individual. And um, I think the best uh, advice or best teachings that one can find about sexual magic are really contained in a book called The Holy Books of Thelema that Crowley uh, received a series of, of what he called class A writings or sacred scriptures. And within these sacred scriptures are a great many keys, I believe, to the right attitude for the practice of sexual magic. And um, I think they're almost manuals of, psycho of the psychology of sexual magic and the spirituality of sexual magic. And that's where I would begin to look, I think, for an understanding of sexual magic as practiced by the OTO, the holy books of Thelema. Talking about magic, what is the connection of Prophet Solomon's temple and the secret societies? Well, Zane, as you know, I wrote a book on Solomon's temple uh, called The Temple of Solomon from Ancient Israel to Secret Societies. And the, the Temple of Solomon is a fundamental aspect of, of Western culture. It's, it's, a, um, it's a story in the Bible, a very famous story. And of course, as you know, it's, it's very much a part and a controversial part of, of modern political culture in the, in the Mideast because the temple is in Jerusalem on the Dome of the Rock or the Temple Mount, which is now the home of the Dome of the Rock. So it, it, its relevance to, uh, West, to modern culture is as true today as it was 3,000 years ago when the Temple of Solomon stood on that same rock. Um, but from an archetypal and spiritual point of view, what makes the temple so interesting is that it's the symbol of the divine on earth. It's the presence of God. God indwells the temple. Solomon built the temple with the intention of providing a home for the Ark of the Covenant, which, as you'll remember, was taken through the exodus from Egypt, brought through the desert for 40 years, and housed in a tent called the Tabernacle. After the Jews arrived in Israel, they, their kings began to look for a more permanent place for the, for the Ark of the Covenant. And Solomon was instructed by God and his father, King David, to build, to build such a sacred uh, building. And he hired 
um, local masons. And uh, in fact, uh, he wrote to a friend of his in in what would be modern Lebanon. Uh, the the king of Lebanon was named Hiram, and he wrote to his friend Hiram of Tyre to send an architect down to uh, to Jerusalem who could help with the uh, construction of the temple. And uh, they used wood, the cedars of Lebanon, because they had a, a much better timber uh, than, than w existed in, in Israel. And furthermore, their craftsmen were more skilled. So that's considered to be the origin of Freemasonry. They say that uh, Solomon, King Hiram of Tyre, and uh, uh, Hiram Abiff, who was the chief architect of Lebanon, were the three grand masters of their day. And what they did was build a perfect temple in which the Ark of the Covenant was housed and which was a sacred home for God on earth. And the high priest entered the temple, entered the Holy of Holies one day a year to convey and receive the blessings from God for the community and for, in fact, all of humanity on that one special day. And that temple room, the Holy of Holies, housed the ark for going on 400 years. And then uh, it was lost. The Jews fell from grace and, and the presence of the Lord departed and the Ark of the Covenant became uh, disappeared from the historical record. What does this mean for spirituality? It's probably the most important single archetype or symbolic uh, story of the presence of God on earth and the worthiness of the human body as a temple of the Lord. You mentioned Freemasonry as being a part of the royal family and also American presidency. Could you blame people to perceive a Freemasonry of controlling the world and seeking a new world order? I, I don't blame people for thinking that, <clears throat> but I think that they are uh, mistaken. I think that at the, at the time of the uh, American and the French Revolution, there were a great many Masons in positions of political power. And um, there was also a, a, a youth and a kind of a vigor to the idea of, of these ideas of freedom and, and those ideals, freedom and revolution, and those ideals were espoused by Freemasonry and they were embraced by uh, politicians and, and wheeler dealers in, in government and finance and other places. Today, I believe the forces that we're working against are far more secular in, in their um, organization. I don't believe that um, people like George Soros, for example, uh, are running around in magical robes, uh, burning incense and performing uh, initiation rituals to test human character. Uh, Warren Buffett is more interested, I think, in uh, his finances and evading taxes than he is in what I would call God or the, thing, the things that Freemasons are pledged to be interested in. I think today what you have, and, and I think it comes about as a result of the communist movement of the mid 19th century, is you have a, at least in the West, you have a, um, a, a, a far more cynical group of atheists, for the most part, who are interested solely in the acquisition of power for its own ends and the manipulation of society. 
and uh, the regimentation and collectivization of of uh, people in the United States. You know, I think that uh, our current president is the living example of the of the collectivist ideology having risen to power and taken over. I don't think that guy has a religious bone in his body that would be stimulated by something like Freemasonry. Um, I think his is the politics of resentment and his religion, such as it is, came through, you know, communist agents like Jeremiah Wright, who were talking about the politics of, of hatred. They've made a bit of an alliance with Islam of all things, which I don't quite understand other than the fact that Islam has a great deal of collectivism in, in its practice. All people are supposed to do things the same way. Sharia law is supposed to uh, influence you know, an entire society, including those who disagree with it. That is really the collectivist ideal. The Masonic ideal, I think, is that people should be free to believe and practice as they will, as they believe, as long as they don't hurt anyone else. I mean, we, we certainly don't want people running around uh, killing other people with guns. But on the other hand, in America, uh, our citizens are guaranteed the right to keep and bear arms. So if one does that in a peaceful way, according to the American ideal, the Freemasonic ideal, I might call it, they should be free to own guns. According to the collectivist ideal, no. Whether they behave themselves or not, they must be treated as almost idiot children who are forced to do things a certain way. Um, this is not the ideal of liberty, and this is what I believe is the absolute basic principle of Freemasonry. The ideal of liberty, I believe, is their absolute bottom line, and it's why I'm happy to know that America was founded by Freemasons, but no, I don't believe Freemasons are running the world. I almost wish they did. Thank you so much, James Weserman, to be in our show. And I look forward to coming back. This has been a wonderful experience for me. Thank you. We were speaking with James Weserman on the topic of decoding the OTO, the secret society. Until the next query arises, this is Anne Khan. Take care and goodbye.